What's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode one of our new podcast, Can I Kick It? Yes, you can. That is so horrible. God. Oh, that hurts my soul when you said that. Hey, <laughs> it's, it's, it was it was an open door. I decided to walk right through it. Well, this is your host, Elliot Barr, and he's joining me as always, my good man. Shanir Duran the second. And pretty much, we decided to create this podcast to focus on... African American, Caribbean players, and famous African players, and what they brought to the game of soccer, how important they were. That's the whole focus of this podcast. Yeah, so basically, this series is not going to be a history lesson on black players. It won't. It'll. We'll talk about their careers, yeah. highlight the main points, the excitement, and some of what they brought to the game, but it won't be a history lesson. You don't need to take notes. Yeah, we're not going to go, like, super-duper boring. You're not going to feel like you're back in a college class. Uh, we're going to have fun with this podcast. We're going to be talking about, I think episode one talks about DeMarcus, uh, DeMarcus Beasley. And then we're going to be talking about, like, players such as uh, Ernie Stewart, Bill Hameen, uh Vincent Company, so on and so forth. Everyone. Yeah. Rio Ferdinand. Rio Ferdinand. Everyone. We're going to be talking about everyone. Um, so we just ask you that you support us. And always like, subscribe to our podcast and our other podcast, River City 93. You know, we want to put that out there. Um, but with that being said, we're going to open the show talking about our first ever person on the show is Demarcus Beasley. Yes. <laughs> also known as the ultimate teammate. <laughs> Honestly, if you look at his career, that's, that's, a, that's a very apt description. Uh, he started off, he really was the ultimate teammate for the way how, I think Jurgen asked the question, this comes from like the Great Wall podcast, um, where you pretty much, Jurgen asked, I was like, hey, why didn't you work out in Germany? Which I, one, I feel is like a very Jurgen type question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very, a very Jurgen Klopp. Uh, Jurgen Klopp, the good oh one. God. Yeah. <laughs> but the I other feel, Jurgen. Yeah. Jürgen and Klinsmann. I feel like Beasley pretty much said he was just like, well, you know, the coach didn't like me because I only played four games and he bought me for a reason, but never played me. And Jurgen was pretty much just like, no, I think it was something that you did. You probably didn't do too much. And I think. From that moment on, it kind of changes the market's mindset because instead of him going and be this winger that was effective but really wasn't effective because it's a five-year period in his career mm-hmm. when he goes on loan to Man City, where he goes on loan, I mean, goes to Rangers for a couple of years, go to Hanover, he hasn't played over 20 games. It is not until he comes to Mexico, Puebla, and then the Houston, and he plays left back that he kind of see the change in his career. He kind of yeah. gained his title of the ultimate teammate. Yeah. Um, but let's go and start off from the beginning because that's a whole nother story. But Beasley starts off at IMG Academy, which I didn't know until I started researching him that he didn't go to college. Nope. <laughs> Wasn't aware of that. <laughs> nope. He pulled a LeBron James and he said, I'm good with it. Uh, uh, the <laughs> IMG Academy, though, I don't think it is in existence anymore. It is basically... A boarding school for athletes in Florida. Yeah, pretty much. That's, that's what it was. I think yeah. Josie's from that program as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I mean, if you look at how DeMarcus Beasley was, he was kind of like the cream of the crop there. I mean, granted, you also had other players like Landon Donovan, I believe, and uh, Oguchi and Wayu. Uh, they were also part of the U.S. residency program. But DeMarcus Beasley held his own. I mean, if you look at it, in 1999, he gets selected to U-17 World Cup team, where he wins the silver ball. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> you know, Ken was kind of impressive. Uh, I gotta say, even in his own right, I think he was like, you know, I'm good, but I didn't think I was that good <laughs> to get the silver ball. <laughs> it's kind of one of those things. But I mean... Uh, like, the crazy thing is, he was part of, like, the first ever class at the USC residency program mm-hmm. at, like, 99. Um, that was known as Project 2010 with this whole grand plot of saying, like, by 2010, 
we're going to have all these amazing players and we're going to get to the World Cup final and none of that ever happened. Not really. <laughs> Not really. None of that ever happened. <laughs> But but it, but one thing you do need to realize is that there was improvement, um, because you have to think about this. In 1999, USA just came off of a, of a disastrous World Cup. Yeah, the 98 World Cup was embarrassing, and for them to come up with this revolutionary idea and say, "Look, we're going to do things differently, and we're going to bring in these young players." And we're going to breed them, develop them, and, and turn them into a squad to be feared. When you look, you go into the 2002 World Cup, you can see that, okay, this is on the right track. Because we go into the first game, and by the end of the first half, we're 3-0 up against Portugal, who was favorite to win the, to win the World Cup. One of the favorites, I, I should say. So, <clears throat> this was a very revolutionary program. And, I mean, DeMarcus Beasley... Coming out of there with the likes of, like you said, Landon Donovan, Bobby Convey, Kyle Beckerman. Um, Gucci and Wayu. Oh, Gucci and yeah. um, Just, it's, 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 he's, he's rubbing shoulders with big names. Yeah. From yeah. the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so, while he's at IMG Academy, he gets an offer. I think he gets, he doesn't get selected at MLS, right? I think he's... I think the LA Galaxy just offer him like, yes. you want to go play for us? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much like the Wild Wild West of like the early, <laughs> early yeah, this, is, this is this is like um, what what is that what is that Netflix show? What the English Game? Oh, just you want to come play for us? <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll give you room and board. Come play. Be our friend. <laughs> um, so he signs with LA Galaxy, Galaxy, and I find the story kind of interesting. And he talks about this also in the Grand Wall podcast about how he was ready to just drop school and be like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I made it. <laughs> but his parents kind of make him stick around. And I think that was probably the best thing for him because I think a young Beasley, I was about to say Bradley, and you've got to be so many times about that. <laughs> um, a young Beasley was ready to, you know, just drop everything and go to LA Galaxy yeah. at the time. And I don't think that might have been the right move, but he instead, um, he gets traded to Chicago Fire. That replaced the game for LA Galaxy, which would have kind of been kind of interesting to see how Beasley would have done in LA Galaxy. But he goes to Chicago Fire. He gets traded for two uh, draft picks, 2000, 2001 first rounder. So he had some value to him. He wasn't like mm-hmm. a scrub. Yeah. And he was at Chicago. He did pretty well. I mean, he won, what, a U.S. Open Cup there and a Supporter Shield? Yes. Yeah. And I think it was that 2003 season um, that he kind of cements as like one of his top games, like, one of his best seasons is the reason why PSV was like, yeah, we're going to pay almost close to $3 million for this American player. Yes. Which, which at that time, okay, it wasn't, uh, you know, front of the sports section of the newspaper type of deal, but that is still, for an American at that time, that is still a big amount of money, a big chunk of money. Chunk of cash. I mean, even relative to today, that's still a big amount of money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, for an American player, for I mean, a young American yeah, player. Yeah, and too, also huh? like, so when he makes the move to PSV, um, there's a famous player that a lot of people know. You know, on the right wing, but I think at this time he's playing on the left wing. Yeah, who will cut inside to score a goal? Uh, Ozzie Robin. <laughs> We've all heard of him. Um, he goes to Chelsea at this time, and Gus hitting. Pretty much buys the Marcus Beasley to be the, the replacement. replacement. Yes. And gives him the number 11 shirt, which is like, I mean, imagine if that news broke today of like a player going to, let's say for instance, like to Liverpool to replace Mohamed Salah. No, you're thinking too big. <laughs> More yeah, like but, going to Ajax to replace Frankie de Jong. Who, yeah. You know, like, yeah. something like that is like, yeah, I, was try, I was just trying to think of a winger, but I would say probably Mo Salah yeah, at Roma before. <laughs> so replace him at Roma before he went to, right. to Liverpool. But that was like a big, you know, that was like big thing. Um, it is also funny because Beasley in a, a YouTube clip, he also mentions how a lot of his teammates at Houston didn't know that he played in Champions League, nor the fact that he was like the top scorer for PSV. That one year appeared um, the in top, the Champions League. Yeah, in the Champions League, scored four goals in the in 
in 12 Champions League games. And, it, I mean, you're thinking, oh, well, that's not a lot. Well, look at, you know, look at the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo. Look at the likes of um, Wayne Rooney. Look at the likes of... But you need to remember that this is PSV. Yeah, he was this the top scorer at PSV. At, at PSV. Before, no. Um, before, and champion. not only that, PSV is is an underdog in the Champions League, yeah. and for them, for him to uh, make that much of a name for himself, um, and and going toe to toe with with teams like uh, AC Milan at the time, AC Milan was the all star team yeah. of that era with players like. Clarence Zedor, Clarence Zedor, Kaká at his best. Paolo Maldini, <laughs> Maldini, the only guy, um, the, the only the, yeah, the only defender in the world, Paolo Maldini, that looked at tackling like it was like second class. Yeah, it's like I don't need to tackle; I'm just better than you. <laughs> exactly, like and and to beat them, yeah, uh, to beat them at the Philip at the Philip Stadion, three one. I mean, that that is a big deal, and for him to. To be a part of that team and to play a pivotal role yeah. for that team. So, while he's at PSV, he you know he has his big first year there. Um, he's also the first American ever to play in the Champions League semifinal. If they, uh, they're probably not beating AC Milan, but he had the chance, the closest chance of being the first American to play in the Champions League final. Yeah, something cool. Um, but it, again, to 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 point this out, this is this is not a. We're going to play AC Milan, and they sweep the floor with us in the first game, and the second game they don't even try as hard, so we end up winning it. But they, AC Milan won on away goals. Yeah. So it was 3-3, and because AC Milan scored an away goal, they went they went on. So okay. it's, it's close. That's a close run thing. So to play at that level as an underdog, playing for a, a Dutch club, and we already, I mean, those who really follow the game a lot can know that the Dutch are known for their technicality, especially with the passing game. We know that the Barcelona way comes I mean, from you, the Netherlands. Yeah. And so knowing that a player like DeMarcus Beasley coming from the United States who are known, Americans who are known to be hardworking, talentless players, to be able to fit into this system and thrive is a big deal. And I mean, also, it has to be something said about the fact that American is not only playing in the Champions League, but like starting. Like he's one of the key players in this team. Exactly. And a, a coach that everyone knows, Gus Hooding, pretty much had the confidence in him. But like, yeah, we're buying this kid, and we're gonna make him one of the starters of the team. Now, granted, his second year didn't go as well. Um, from what I could find out, there wasn't really no injury. I think he just had a downturn. Yeah. I think getting used to it and everything. So mm-hmm. after two years in PSV, I think. You know, he goes on loan to Man City for a year. He always wanted to go play in Europe. I think, wasn't it him that had the option to go play in Southampton? Or was it someone else? We've been researching uh, a lot no, of people. I think, I think it, uh, was it... I'm like 90% certain he had an opportunity to go to Southampton, but something happened. Like, MLS turned it out because it wasn't enough money. I think I think that did happen. Okay. I believe, yes, it was him. He was close to being in uh, 04. Oh, for, okay. In 04. That's what I remember. I remember seeing that one. <laughs> but it did happen. So then he goes to Man City, goes on loan. And this is before Man City has, like, oil money pumped into it. Exactly. <laughs> this, is, this is Man City for... I want you to be people to, out there listen to this. Like, this is Man City of, like, we finished 12th. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> That's that Man. table. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's that Man City. Um, and also the other thing, too, is, like, he... I want to say the Marcus Beasley during this period of time was injury prone or wasn't up to like level of play. Like, am I wrong in saying that? I mean, he. I think one of the issues with the Marcus Beasley at that time was he loved to dribble. He loved to to go at defenders. He yeah. loved to 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 run. And it is very like you look at a player players for example like. Um, Michael Owen or Obama Yang, very injury prone. No, it's not because they're weak. It's because they're fast 
Demarcus Beasley is very fast. Yeah. So that speed puts you in danger when a defender is coming at you. Maybe I've never you ran that fast, so I wouldn't know. Oh, no. Pace, you, <laughs> because, and this is one of the reasons why a lot, of, just a small digression here, a lot of people who aren't familiar with the game of soccer think that soccer players are, are soft because, oh, he went down. If you're running at full speed and you're really fast, just somebody brushing your leg. That can leave a mark. If <laughs> you're moving extremely fast. And so, players like DeMarcus Beasley, because he relied so much on his pace early on in his career, because he, he liked to run at defenders, he got knocked around a lot. Yeah. He, he got he got a, quite a few knocks in his career. Um, even though he only had, I think, um, this was also in the, the um, Grant Walsh interview, he, I think he only had one really serious injury in his career. I mean, you... you He's he's gotten knocks. He's, he's he's gotten beat up pretty badly for his pace, but he definitely was injury prone because of that. So yeah, I mean that was one of the things that I found kind of interesting. Like he got his move to England. Like to to an American player, like you want to go prove yourself to either Germany, mm-hmm. England, yeah. Spain, <sighs> Italy. Well, At see, the Spain, time, Italy was... Yeah, was, but see, there was no really context of Americans going to Italy and Spain and France, like, really proving it. It was kind of like England and Germany. We're kind of yeah. like, these are the two... The more popular yeah. ones here in the States, yeah. So he goes to Man City. He, he scores against West Ham, but then kind of after that, it's kind of like... <laughs> nothing else really happens for him. Like, he, nothing else really happens. Yeah. He only plays in, what, 13 games to score four goals, but... yeah. Nothing stuff. It's not like Man City brings them back and say like, "Hey, look, we want to be part of the team. We're gonna bring you back on a permanent basis." No, they he goes back. He goes back. Yeah, he goes back to PSV. To PSV, and then he gets to move to Rangers, which is only like seven hundred k at the time. Yeah, I mean, this is also an era where transfer fees won't fall. Like, so yeah. seven hundred k for an American injury prone has probably has a label of injury prone. It kind of works out for him. I mean, yeah, it works out for him. It it does. Um, but he had an interesting time at Rangers. Um, but at least there, with a with a US teammate, Claudio Reyna. Yeah, he's only the second American. Well, at the time, he's only the second American, not including Claudio Ranieri. I mean, <laughs> excuse that, Claudio to play at Rangers. Yes. Um. But the, one of the more interesting things that we found out about him was that he had his car bombed at Rangers. Now, a, a lot of a lot of things happened when he played for Rangers. Uh, you had the the car bomb it was the first incident. Um, yeah, that that was it. I mean, it was just interesting. So um, pretty much from the story that I gathered, um, it, it wasn't like anyone was specifically targeting him. It wasn't like he pissed the fans off. I think from from what they say the report it was uh it was not believed to be sectarian related. For those of you that don't know, um I know a lot of people who are listening probably are aware of the deep and bitter rivalries in the world of football. In for example, um Real Madrid and Barcelona, yeah. Manchester United and Liverpool, Arsenal and Tottenham. Um you know, Celtic and Rangers are a whole different. Model. Celtic and Rangers <laughs> is like those on steroids because it is not just a situation of we don't like that team. It's a situation of Glasgow, a city in Scotland, which is literally religiously divided. And so there is behind the teams, behind the the soccer, there is a religious rivalry. There is a religious um, battle that's yeah. going on. So they they said that it was not related to that. So from what it seems like, it seems like just some wrong idiot, place, wrong so, time. Exactly, some idiots just picked the wrong car and just bombed it. Yeah. <laughs> like you said, <laughs> like the thing that made me laugh the most, and I think I texted you about this. Like he literally just looked at this when it was like. Is that my car? <laughs> <laughs> That's my car. <laughs> and then he goes to Twitter and just been like, yeah, I'm in the market for a new car because my car's blown up. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I'm bad. Like, I, 
He said, like, there's other teams that had a car broken in and stuff like that, but it was never on the case of, like, having your car blown up. Yeah. And it happened to him. I mean, mean, like, like vandalism on one is is one thing, but just to blow up someone's car, that's a bit, that's that's going over the top a little too much. (laughs) Oh, this is one thing I forgot to bring up at this time in PSV. And this is, like, one of the funnier stories we find out, because DeMarcus Beasley has, like, a multitude of nicknames. Mm -hmm. So, like, one of his nicknames is Beast or DeMarcus or whatever. Um, Another one was Gumby. About how he was just like, you know, early in his career, he can, like you said, like he can run and he would get knocked out and get back up. Like he was yeah. like, he, yeah, he 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 wouldn't. <clears throat> he recovered from injuries very quickly, yeah. apart from that one serious one. Um, but one of the more interesting nicknames was the one he got from Marco Van Brommel, uh when he was at PSV, and his nickname was McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> and he said the reason why he was named McDonald's is because. The PSV players at the time thought all Americans ate burgers and like McDonald's and stuff. So every time they went out to eat, they would be like, "Hey, bees, what you getting? Are you getting a burger? Are you getting McDonald's?" And his, it just stuck. His nickname was McDonald's, which I thought oddly hilarious. <laughs> I, my thing is, if Demarcus Beasley was a little on the bigger side. And would just happen to be really strong. Maybe if he looked more like, say, someone like Romelu Lukaku, I could maybe understand that. But Demarcus Beasley, Beasley is practically skin and bones. How are you gonna call somebody like that McDonald's? <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was hilarious. That, um, I mean, that went to show you around that time, um, basically. How Americans are viewed <laughs> by Europeans. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so. Getting back to Rangers, <laughs> um, his time as Rangers, I, I would describe it as mostly ups with a couple of downs, yeah. and I think the downs are more off the field stuff, like the car bombing and the, the racism. The racism, racism. yeah. At, um, that was a Champions uh, League game, Champions right? League qualifying game okay. in August of two thousand seven against uh, FK Zeta, which is in Montenegro, and. Um, so basically, him and a French teammate, Jean Claude, uh, I'm gonna make sure I pronounce his last name right, Darcheville. I think you're right. Uh, were victims of of racist chants during that game. Every time either one of them would even touch the ball, there would be monkey chants throughout the stands, and I mean, I know this topic has been broached. Uh, a lot in the soccer world today, this kind of shows you that this has been going on for a long time. This is 13 years ago. You know, this is something that has been going on in the soccer world for a very, very long time. And I think with regards to DeMarcus Beasley, there is a sense that, um, I mean, at the end of the day, it was it was basically all swept under the rug. FIFA didn't really do anything about it, much like they're doing today. <laughs> and um, what's interesting is uh, he had uh, he was interviewed, and there was an article about it in um, in ESPN uh, regarding the situation where Demarcus Beasley was saying that uh, FIFA isn't doing anything to stop racism, and he said that it, it's basically going to get to a point where a player comes off the field to attack a fan because of it. Yeah. Lo and behold, a few months later, Eric Dyer punches a fan for that reason. Tottenham's Eric Dyer. Yeah. And so, I mean, there have been warning signs. That, that I would say, would be a shot across the bow. Yeah. And I'm hoping that players like Demarcus Beasley, players like Ian Wright, Players like um, like Eric Dyer, Paul Pogba, Balotelli, players like this push for FIFA to do something. Because at, at the end of the day, this shouldn't be the norm. This should not be the norm anywhere in the world. You're going to get your average idiot. Of course, it's going to happen. It happens everywhere. I mean, I mean, I've seen it happen mm-hmm. at City Stadium, yeah. but City Stadium is not known for having any kind of racism yeah. at all. Yeah, and I mean, the other thing to it is, is like, like you said, like, 
DeMarcus brought this up in what, 2005, 2006? And yeah. he literally, like, kind of was the precursor. saying like, yeah, someone's going to go into the stands and mess somebody up. And then literally, like, a whole decade later, you got Eric Dyer doing it. Yeah. Shame, I, I, I mean, it's not right at all. Um, but, I mean, how would you describe DeMarcus Beasley's, like, career at Rangers? Like, how would you describe it? Because it's not something that's really talked about, but it's something that everyone knows. I mean, apart, I feel like a lot of Americans, apart from his time at Chicago, at Houston, I think a lot of people know him for being in Glasgow. Okay. Um, I know that I, that was the, when I had um, really gotten into him and his style of play and truly understanding him, it was actually um, shortly after a World Cup qualifying match um, at Gillette Stadium I actually went to and I mean Beasley one one thing that you can use to characterize Beasley is feisty yeah. he's not dirty he's not a dirty player he, he's not going to do anything untoward but he is feisty um, he has pace he's aggressive I would say that he's kind of like Kobe Jones except I feel like not as nice because I feel like Kobe Jones was the type of player that would would blow past players but once he gets clipped he'll just get up and look at the ref and be like you're gonna handle that DeMarcus Beasley would was the type to take matters into his own hands and be like you're gonna regret you're gonna regret that later and you could see it his fight the way he he fought for every ball very physical and for someone his size of his stature you wouldn't expect that kind of strength from but he was a he was a joy to watch and a vicious vicious player, um, so I think I I I don't think this stay at Glasgow kind of defined him at all. But I do feel that his 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 time at Glasgow was actually the most eventful. Probably. I mean, if you if you look at, I mean, anything's eventful. You get your car blown up. <laughs> you know, I don't think no. you get more eventful than that. <laughs> I mean, even even on the field, even on the field, I think, <laughs> um, I think, uh, Beasley could go back to Glasgow any day and be recognized on the street immediately. Yeah. And one of the funny things I found out, so the. Before Beasley left Rangers, um, he was thinking about leaving like 2009, December 2009, January 2010. He was thinking like, all right, I want to kind of go somewhere. Because he was kind of getting forced out of the Rangers squad. Because mm-hmm. um, he was just like not playing. Yeah. And plus he wanted to be part of the 2010 World Cup. So <laughs> there's another story about how funny DeMarcus player history is. He decides to stay and he... Played in two games. Dundee United, Motherwell plays well. After the Motherwell game, he comes out and says, like, hey, I want to stay here longer. You know, I want to play and help the team win a title. So Rangers are like, all right, cool. Rangers win the title, <laughs> but DeMarcus doesn't play enough games to qualify himself to get a To, to get a medal. medal. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm like, yo, that's so messed up. <laughs> that that <laughs> man could have literally left and been like, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, no, we want you to stay. But you're not getting the medal. Wait, that's messed up. That is. that. That's kind of... I'm like, oh, dang, dude. But, so he leaves Rangers. He goes to Hanover. And there's not a whole bunch to be saying about this. Hanover time. Four games. That yeah. was it. He literally, I, I, I don't know if he got frozen out, if he got hurt. I think he probably just wasn't a good fit. <laughs> that's what it seems like. But, again, we go back to that... Um, the his uh, interaction with uh, Jurgen Klinsmann um, with Klinsmann basically saying, you know, basically telling him, look, if you're not the best guy in that position, you're not going to start. That's basically what he was trying to get at. Yeah. Um, basically, you can even see to the point where you'll have teams where the best player on the team and the coach absolutely hate each other. But that coach is not an idiot. He's going to play that player yeah, every game point. because he knows he's going to get results. I mean, the meet, player. Beasley made that on point as well. Like, you know, I probably wasn't in the right mind space. So I think I think that, 
I think that Hanover moment at the time is probably the reason why he makes the move to Point Blanc mm-hmm. and why also I think Beasley himself makes the move to play in left back. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, for me, for instance, like that's how I was introduced to Marcus Beasley when I started getting the game. So I was yes. to Marcus Beasley as his as left, left back. back. Yes. And I, mean, and I think that's where he really found his niche. In yeah, terms he was. Of, of, of I mean, play. Because he's kind of played all over the pitch. Well, to be honest, we haven't players. found a left back since DeMarcus Beasley. Yeah. No, there hasn't been anyone that could really fill those shoes. Those, 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 those are some big shoes to fill. And I mean, at Puebla, he, you know, he did really well. Scored a couple of goals. Was in a competitive Puebla team, I believe, at the more time. But I think, you know, 2014, he becomes a designated player for Houston. And I think if... If you had to ask me, someone that got into soccer right around 2014-2015, I think Beasley is like Mr. Houston in my idea. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he was club captain or anything, but I remember like him winning the 2018 U.S. Open Cup with them. Yes, you know? yes. Um, and you know, the Marcus Beasley, he was he was there for five years, for for nearly five years. So that's that's a that's a pretty long time. Uh, to be at Houston, and I think that was that was probably his more successful season. Um, yeah, he had three seasons at Puebla. But I mean, Puebla, I think got him back on the map because remember, like there was a five year period where he didn't play over twenty games. Yeah, he he was, and he uh, finally got to playing back to regular games, which honestly I think helped the longevity of Demarcus Brad Marcus Beasley. For the long run, because, you know, Pueblo Houston, he's playing 30-plus matches. Where Rangers, he's only playing, I think he played no more than, I want to say, 18? Mm, no, 10. 10? 11. No, I think his first season at Rangers, he played 11 games. Okay. Scored two. Yeah. So, I mean, you look at games, that. that is. I mean, know, that's kind of like the, the, the mythology, the, the lore of DeMarcus Beasley. Like, he is... This guy that's never going to retire, you know, because he's always going to be there. He's the ultimate teammate. He's yeah. Co- like, that's who he is. But I think, you know, that stretch of five years where he wasn't playing week in, week out helps him out in the back end of his career where he kind of submits himself even more. Yes. You know? Yeah, and you can see he learned a lot from it. He learned a lot from it. He learned where he was going wrong to earn playing time. And that that's one thing that... I feel that a lot of people need to take from DeMarcus Beasley is that aspect of always learn from your experiences. He took that information, took the fact that he wasn't getting a lot of playing time, and he evolved. He molded himself into the player that would be chosen for him. I mean, you're talking about a player that out of all the players that's played for U.S. soccer, only three players have been to four World Cups. Him... Casey Keller and Claude, um, Claude uh, Reina. Reina. He's the only player to play in four. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the they other two have went to four. four. He's the only one to play, play in four. Exactly. And it, like honestly, I don't think he makes two thousand. I don't think he makes. Two, he doesn't make two thousand fourteen. If it's not, if he doesn't make that switch to left back, which he makes the switch to left back because of the snow game. Yes. And he plays left back and has this amazing game. And, I mean, when it comes talking to um, Beasley, I think there's, like, certain moments in his career that stand out more than others. I mean, obviously, it's the snow game, for one. Yes. And I think the other game that also sticks out is him scoring the decisive goal in the 2005 Dose Cero, the World Cup qualifier game, where he scores, yes. like, not off of a corner. He kind of gets the relay ball from a corner and then scores it. I've broken out this goal like 30 times. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear, like from the angle, I was like, the first time I saw it, I was like, is he onside? <laughs> I was like, he's not onside. And then I saw it from another angle, I was like, oh, he was onside. He was onside. <laughs> and that, and again, that's good, good, that showcased his pace. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, if you want to say like, <laughs> Beasley's career really got its kickstart. Of course, in the 99 U17 World Cup. But if you go 2002 World Cup, I mean, 2002 Gold Cup, he has a good tournament. He says that tournament alone got him to that 2002 World Cup team that mm-hmm. is 
so far <laughs> the best World Cup team we've had in the last 30, 40 years. Yes, yes. And I mean, just look at it. <laughs> I mean, he gets us there. He he has an amazing tournament. 2006, I think, is an overall down year, but he kind of leaves the assist for the only goal that we score in 2006. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. he did something positive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and 2010 comes back, and that that was a pretty decent year for USA. Yeah. Um, and of course, 2014. 2014. Yeah, you know, I I think he played every game in 2014. 2000, 2010, I think he was a sub mostly. Yeah. 2014 played every game at left back. Um. You know that that that's a pivotal year for U.S. soccer. Um, 2014. You know, you know. Yeah. Goal, oh, one goal in 30 seconds against Ghana. Um, that that crazy game against Por- Portugal, there was a lot in that in that World Cup, and he was in the midst of all of that. He was um, a constant in that entire World Cup. And I think the other thing too was like he also won a gold <laughs> boot in the two thousand five Gold Cup. You yeah. know, with three goals, which is like you won a golden boot with three goals. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, th- that's all the lore of like Beasley. Um. So, yeah, so you got anything else? Oh, how can we also forget this about Beasley before I wrap up? Because I was about to prematurely wrap it up. <laughs> you know, Beasley just recently retired. He's also said that he's like, hey, I'm not coaching. He's, he said, I'm not, I'm not coaching <laughs> I'm not and I'm not coming back. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> but it's cool to see, like, other players like them getting more into management. And I, I'll talk about it, like, from other sports perspective. We've always heard, like, how players... When they retire, they always get back into coaching. That's their way of getting, you know, kind of getting back into the sport. And I think soccer's a little bit different because now you have a lot of players. It's definitely U.S. players that are getting into ownership. Mm-hmm. You know, Tim Howard with Memphis now on one. Landon Donovan with San Diego Loyal. Um, Jimmy Conrad with the San Francisco Glints It's in League Two. Um, and, you know, Beasley's about to start his own League One team. Yeah. In Fort Wayne, Indiana, his home team, which he also has a soccer school there. So he had his own breeding ground already, basically. Yeah. And so that that was a very smart move by him. I feel um, you want to lay the, the groundwork, and and he talks about how much he he's he's drawn to the business side of soccer in the interview with uh, Grant Wall. He he talks about how he he didn't ever want to coach, but he definitely um, he definitely was was interested in the business side of it. So now to hear that he's going to be um, heading a USL team, um, mm-hmm. is it going to be championship or League One? It's going to be League One. League One. So yeah. we'll, we'll see him. We'll, we'll be seeing him. Well, I mean, we probably also, won't be seeing him. He's part of ownership. He's probably not going to travel with the oh, team. Oh, he'll travel. <laughs> oh, I guarantee you. I guarantee you he's going to travel. <laughs> I guarantee you. Well, occasionally here and there. You're, but <laughs> you're, one, you're owning a team, you're traveling. It's just... Just to be like, yeah, you know, I own the squad. Yeah. (laughs) You know, that's kind of how it works. In my head, I imagine it like that. Um, So, yeah. So, anything else from you, my man, before we wrap up? Um, Basically, DeMarcus Beasley is a big part of USA's recent soccer history. Um, One thing that... I feel is a regret is that he is not as well known as he deserves to be. I mean, yeah. But I, I think it's fitting that. because he is not a limelight player. No. He's not a player who wants to be in the limelight, in your face, paparazzi following all all around. He is your typical honest, hardworking soccer player who basically says, "I I just want to play the game," yeah. and, I, and I I really really love that about him. And the thing is, I think it's interesting the fact that him and Landon Donovan, I hope I can describe this properly, like, it's cool to see that him and Landon Donovan are cool, such close friends with each other, and their great careers kind of start off the same, like, both of them in the 99 U.S. Um, U-17 team, both of them start off in MLS, both of them go to Europe around the same time, both of them come back to MLS around the same time. Yeah. Well, mm, give or take, Landon's here a little bit longer, but, you know, you know what I'm saying. Like, it's kind of cool to see that and both of these guys were staples of the U.S. men's national team. Played in three World Cups together. And I think, you know, our argument can be made for Beasley had as much impact, if not more, than Landon Donovan had 
and are getting players to be part of U.S. soccer. You know, Landon Donovan. I mean, Landon Donovan is a great spokesman for U.S. soccer. Yeah, Beasley's yeah. in that same boat, right? I mean, and you got to you got to understand. You got to remember. Go go USA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's probably ahead of anyone else. <laughs> but I mean, like, for instance, like player like Josie Altador, you know, showing pretty much saying like, if it wasn't that for Beasley, I'm probably not getting into soccer. You know, I'm or I'm probably not as passionate about it as I was, and I think he was that for a lot of players, and I think for a lot of African Americans looking to get into the game, I think Demarcus Beasley is a fine. A great example of how to be, you know, you start off as one player, like, and instead of just being like, well, like, he says it himself, like, I could have, after things didn't work out at PSV, I could have just gone back to MLS and made 60K and been like, well, that's whatever. Yeah. Remember from that PSV Rangers. But instead, he goes to Puebla, changes his position in a new country, and becomes probably one of the best left back in North America. Yeah, for one of the best left backs in North America, and probably one of the best left back that USA has seen. Yeah, I mean, think about for it. The you got team. you got to know if you're good. When one, it takes us like five or six years to find someone to fill that position, and two, when you're not in the team, we don't make a World Cup. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you got to know you're pretty good. Um, so I think that's everything for me, my man. You want to lay out the sources we got so people don't think we're plagiarizing? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, so I don't we, got time to get sued. <laughs> we we have a few uh, articles and and websites that we yeah we've got ESPN article ex USMNT great Demarcus Beasley FIFA doing nothing to stop racism there are two articles from the Guardian that we reference one by Ewan Murray I believe is how you pronounce his first name Ewan uh, Demarcus Beasley's car blown up outside his Glasgow home. And the second one is by Tom Dart. Farewell to Demarcus Beasley, a U.S. start with no interest in the limelight. Uh, also, we have the website FamousSoccerPlayers.org. The Grant Wall uh, Planet Football Podcast, uh, an interview with Demarcus Beasley. And another ESPN article by Jeff Carlisle. Demarcus Beasley's post-playing career Plan question mark USL franchise owner in Fort Wayne. So, with all that being said, as always, this is your host Elliot Barr, Shane Rand the second, and in the words of the famous Wale, sue us, we're rooting for everybody that's fine. How did you guys next?